thank you very much, and uh, welcome to our panel today. Uh, I'm going to jump right into it, so we uh, have as much time as we can for our uh, speakers. Um, their bios are in your program, so I will skip over their bios, but from uh, going across the stage from closest to me, uh, Ambassador Farid Asim, uh, amb the Ambassador of Iraq to the United States, and then Nadia Dave Neer. Um, I've asked each of our panelists to start by giving an initial opening statement that answers the question uh, that is the title of this uh, panel, after ISIS, what is next in the Middle East? So I've asked each of our panelists to take about five minutes to initially answer that question before we move into discussion. Ambassador. Uh, thank you, uh, Doug. Well, I uh, thank the organizers for inviting me and for choosing this very timely topic. Uh, perhaps uh, the best way to start this is to emphasize what the future of the Middle East is not going to be. And I'm going to focus on Iraq, and it's not going to be ISIS. Uh, and that is a very, very loaded statement. Uh, and I'll give you two examples that illustrate the difference between what we want, what, what is going to happen, what is happening, in fact, and what could have happened had we not defeated ISIS. Uh, last December, uh, Christians in Mosul celebrated Christmas. Uh, not a, not a bad achievement, you know, when just three, four years ago they had been completely uh, expelled from the city, a thing that hasn't happened in over a thousand years. And then uh, come uh, May, uh, the 12th of May, we are going to have elections uh, in Iraq, uh, national elections. Uh, uh, these are things that we've held to. We've held elections as constitutionally mandated uh, over the last uh, 14 years, which is not a small achievement, I think. And so this, these two uh, examples illustrate the kind of Iraq that we're actually working to, to try to accomplish, uh, to achieve, which is a uh, you know, um, multi-sectarian, multi-ethnic uh, uh, democracy. Um, of course, uh, that's not the whole end of the story because we're coming out of you know, 30 years of dictatorship and then 10 years of occupation and wars and mismanagement and corruption. And so uh, Iraq, ideally, uh, over the next uh, few months and perhaps years, will become uh, a huge shanty town. We're going to start to rebuild uh, the infrastructure that was destroyed by, by ISIS. But not only that, we, I think what we need to also rebuild is uh, our institutions uh, that have suffered quite a deal over the last uh, 30, 40 years uh, in order for us to be able to provide the services that our population uh, is expecting and, and regain their trust. And this is, in fact, the only way for us to ensure that people like ISIS will not find the kind of traction that ISIS found in 2014. Great. Nadia? Uh, thank you all for coming, and I express my gratitude to New America and ASU for uh, bringing us all together. Uh, I agree with the ambassador uh, that ISIS is not the future. So we pay a lot of lip service to the fact that the war is a war of ideas, essentially. That we cannot actually kill our way to victory when it comes to terrorism. So in the past few decades, Saudi Arabia spent billions of dollars to spread Wahhabism. And practically everywhere, there was this ISIS-like doctrine, we have terrorism. So, if we spend billions uh, teaching fascism, would we be surprised if there's a lot of fascism in the world? So if we believe that this is a war of ideas, at least in part, because of course we need protective use of force. So if we agree that the war of ideas is essential, so how do we win this war of ideas, right? So let's look at history. When people talk about the Middle East, they remind audiences, especially those of us who have uh, a hard connection to the Middle East or are born and raised in the Middle East, people often reference two, uh, two uh, times in history where the Middle East was the example by which you know, the world looked up to. One of these phases was the Middle Ages and the other is 19th century Egypt. Let's look at the Middle Ages, people say, oh, well, this is the, the place where there was philosophy and diversity and Sufism. And how did this come about, this peak in civilization? 
And I argue it came about by translating and allowing heretics to speak. Heretics are the answer. Because if you look at all these books, if you look, they were not by people who said, oh, we need to apply Sharia. These were, these were people who actually challenged the norm. Who, people, philosophers like Aviros, Ibn Sina, Arazi, they all have in common is that they had the title heretic. They argued things that were unacceptable, which is why their books were burnt, which is why uh, we only have a few of their books. Argued things like, you know, religion is based on symbols, symbols divide people, but philosophy is the pursuit of a truth, and we can all argue on this value to pursue the truth and value the truth for its own. These authors challenged the norm. There was a space, of course, and that space came from political power. There was visionary, temporary political power that allowed this space to exist. If we look at, at the, the, the peak of, of the 19th century, which, again, these, these, these civilizational peaks stand, stand the, the test of time. They are still phenomenal today as they were in their time. The amount of culture that was produced in Egypt in the first half of the 20th century is still now among the most beautiful spots in history when it comes to Egypt. The movies, go see the movies done in Egypt in the 40s. The music, like Umm Kalthum, the Asmahan, today they are still popular. Today they are still the most beautiful. How did this cultural civilization come about? Well, it was heretical ideas, again. It started with this, um, again, endorsement of power. So this is not to dismiss, this is not, sadly, a, a grassroots movement. Power allowed it. Muhammad Ali sent clerics, in fact, and all sorts of people to bring uh, military knowledge to Egypt. They mastered French, a lot of these scholars, so that they can translate military manuals because Europe was, has become a military power and they were basically destroying the Ottoman Empire, taking you know, uh, countries from under Ottoman rule. And the military power, they could not, basically they couldn't kill their way through it too. So they sent people to Paris. And people like Tahtawi didn't just translate uh, military manuals. He translated Voltaire. He translated Rousseau. He went back to Egypt and introduced theoretical ideas like, we should teach boys and girls alongside one another. We should, I mean, these ideas became so rampant for a very short period. So what we need today is that theoretical voice that is a humanist, that has the enlightenment values. I, I highly recommend a book I'm reading right now called Enlightenment Now, that talks about these values and that how relevant they are still today in winning things like terrorism, which is hitting every capital on, in Europe. These heretics exist. What is so alarming is that companies like Facebook and YouTube are shutting down the Facebook pages of our Voltaire's and our Spinoza's and our Rousseau. Why? Because they are deemed defensive to the most conservative voice, which is in power. So if we really are serious about giving the Middle East and actually all of the humanity I'm sure there's a lot of Americans in this room. We all pay billions of dollars every year to countering terrorism. So it, it's not a Muslim issue, it's a, it's a global issue. So let's support the heretics of the Middle East, and they do exist. Thank you. Thank you. Dave. <clears throat> so I'm gonna try and answer the question um, in a fairly weird way, I guess. Um, I, I think of the region as being like a, a Rubik's Cube, right? It's very complex, but it's not random. It has um, a mosaic of tiles, uh, each of which you can consider as, as a conflict, you know, some hot, some cold. Those tiles are linked to each other. When you move one set, another set move. But, and those linkages are not always obvious, um, but there are some, some patterns. Um, and the different actors in each of these conflicts can move in multiple ways, and when one set of actors moves, it changes the other. Um, now, I should admit, I've never been um, patient enough to actually uh, do a Rubik's Cube. Um, I'm not sure that our current political leadership in this country or many of the other countries in the region are either. Um, but if we think about 
each of the tiles, you know, it's, and ISIS is just one of them. Um, there's the Russia-Turkey alignment, which is currently happening in northern Syria. Um, there's the Syrian civil war itself. There's the ongoing conflict in Yemen. There's the, um, let's say, the mopping up of the remnant of Iraq, uh, of, of ISIS in Iraq. Uh, there's the conflict that many people are talking about that hasn't quite yet happened in Lebanon. There's the Israeli-Palestinian uh, conflict. And then if you go slightly more, um, more broadly, there's some really significant activity going on in Libya, in the Sahel, in Francophone West Africa, in Egypt, and in Somalia. So there's any number of different conflicts. But as I said, th th it's not random. Um, there are a number of linkages that are uh, relatively easy to identify. One of them is the rise of independent Kurdistan, which really became a problem for the region structurally only last year, but obviously has been around for a century. Um, I can remember two years ago at this conference making the comment that we currently like the Kurds primarily because they're the only population group in Iraq that's not actively trying to kill us. Um, but that's not how other people in the region have t t typically seen it. And what happened last September with the referendum really changed a lot of people's calculus. Um, the eclipse of ISIS, and I, I don't think it's permanent, I think it is temporary, and I'll talk about that in a minute, um, is another set, of another set of linkages that drives a lot of what's happening. The entry of Turkey as a combatant into Iraq and Syria, uh, carving out a uh, territorial buffer zone is a, a new factor that's also driving uh, a lot of the realignment in those conflict tiles. Um, frankly, the uncertainty of a lot of actors about US policy and the coherence of US policy and who speaks for US policy has been one of the, the drivers of a lot of things we've seen. And then, I'm not quite comfortable with this terminology, but I think we're seeing the emergence of what you might call an Astana axis, you know, Ankara, Tehran, and uh, Moscow. And that is new uh, in terms of the, the conflict that we're seeing. So as we talk about the Middle East after ISIS, it, it's worth remembering, like, what is ISIS? It's, it's multiple things. And the element that has been eclipsed is one of the three primary components of Daesh, and it's the caliphate the territorial state that existed in Iraq and Syria, and at one point had the population of Singapore and about um, you know, uh, a third of each, each country under its technical control, maybe 22 cities at one point. So something that thought it was a nation state, that fought like a nation state, that tried to govern, us, govern itself like a nation state, and had clearly forgotten the lesson of 1991, which is if you fight the Americans and their allies like you're a nation state, you're gonna get your ass kicked. Um, and now that that territorial entity no longer exists, the other two entities that have always been part of the network, the Wilayat structure in another 20 countries, uh, the, the regional affiliates, and then this kind of ad hoc set of ISIS networks that I call the International, is still in existence. Probably 80% of the structure that existed before the fall of Raqqa is still in existence. Uh, it's simply organized in a different fashion. Um, and so, as I look forward, I think what we're going to see is those drivers, those link linkages in the region, are going to reshape the region geopolitically. Um, of those, I think the entry of Turkey and the rise of Kurdistan are the two most important in a military sense, but by far the most important geopolitical linkage that's realigning is the emergence of Turkey, Russia, and um, Iran as de facto allies. And you see this playing out right now, this afternoon, in the UN Security Council. Um, so uh, I think we're going to look back on this period as a lull. We are going to see ISIS come back. It's simply dropped back to the guerrilla mode from the state-like mode, and now it has many op options to rebuild and recover, and it would not be the first time, wouldn't even be the third or fourth time that this particular crowd of guys have done that. Um, and I'm going to end, because I know Nia has many smarter things to say at our scruffy end of the panel here, um, uh, which is there's the one group that I don't hear people talking about that. Uh, that aren't in the business that more people should be thinking about is Hayat Tahrir al-Sham, which is by far the most capable, politically smart, uh, socially engaged, um, military capable uh, terrorist group that I've ever encountered. And I think it's the next cab off the rank. Even if ISIS takes a while to come back, we're gonna be dealing with HTS uh, in some way in the region uh, in, the, in the immediate future.
So tell me where I'm wrong, man. Yeah. Well, I, I, uh, <laughs> I like the Rubik's Cube analogy. I've used maybe a similar one that the, the region is like an ecosystem, and uh, I've written that that ecosystem was hit by an asteroid in 2003, which was the American invasion, <laughs> which, uh, much like the one that killed the dinosaurs, changed the entire evolution of the region, created new identities, and destroyed old ones. And we're still feeling that. And I think every day in my work in the Middle East, I encounter the ramifications of that. We can tie the election of, of Trump, the refugee crisis uh, in Europe, the rise of the right, obviously ISIS, so many things that happen not just in the Middle East, but even in the West are consequences of that in invasion. Um, so I'm in the Future of War conference, but I think the future doesn't have to be war. It can be more peaceful. Um, part of the problem is that in, uh, in the Middle East is that Washington is addicted to war in the Middle East. I'm not going to look at the entire Middle East, just uh, the, mm. the few places I work. <laughs> I'll start with Iraq. Um, for the first time now in Iraq, there's no force internal or external that's trying to overthrow the government for the first time since 2003. Sunni communities that used to protect or shelter insurgents no longer do that now. Instead, they cooperate with security forces. From Fallujah to Mosul to elsewhere, we see the very same communities that used to shelter insurgents or Al-Qaeda or ISIS now um, wanting to kill not just those insurgents, but even their families, um, taking it to the other extreme. Um, in my view, the Sunni-Shia war in uh, Iraq is, is over. Um, there's no longer any support for a Sunni radical uh, Islamist movement. And otherwise, very depressing Middle East, Iraq is the only place where I find hope in. If you can disregard the last 15 years of horror, Iraq is the only democracy in the Middle East. All actors, from former Sunni hardliners to the most ideologically hardline Shia paramilitary forces, uh, accept the new political order, accept elections and democracy, uh, and believe that that's a legitimate way of at attaining power and uh, um, are no longer trying to overthrow the government in any other way. There's a, consensus, there's, a, there's a belief that consensus and power sharing are essential elements of the process, again, from Sunni hard, former Sunni hardliners to Shia hardliners, everybody in Iraq tends to believe that. Unlike in the past, now with the election uh, season in Iraq, we don't see sectarian incitement or incitement to violence. Um, we see increasing cross-sectarian and cross-ethnic cooperation. Um, the good news is everybody in Iraq is divided. I was at the US Embassy in Baghdad like six months ago and somebody asked me, how can you reunite the Sunnis? I said, that's the last thing that you want to do. You want people to be divided. You don't want sectarian or ethnic blocs emerging. You don't want Iraq to be like Lebanon. You want to see more cooperation across sectarian and ethnic lines, and we see that em emerging in Iraq. Uh, and this is what Iraqis call the blessings of ISIS, which is a shocking word to Westerners, but it's commonly used in Iraq. Um, it forced all actors to change their calculus, and we see much more cooperation and acceptance of the state as a result of that trauma of, of ISIS. Now, there are reports of an ISIS presence between Diyala and Salah Din. Um, they're kind of being left alone for now um, for political reasons, but ISIS can't come back. I don't believe in ISIS 2.0. At most, we'll see remote attacks, checkpoints, the occasional car bomb, but no seizure of territory. So Iraq is likely in a path to greater stability. There's very few actors who want to undermine that stability, like I said. Um, the Saudis with their, and maybe some Americans with their paranoia about Iran can still do some damage. Um, Masoud Barazani still wants to divide Iraq, um, but his ability to do so has been limited. Uh, the, one of the challenges we'll see is that Iraqi actors, other political actors, have to compromise with Barzani um, in terms of the elections because they can't rely on uh, the PUK and Soleimania. Um, and so they're going to have to ally with him, but he wants to divide Iraq. So there's some seeds of problems, but no, no major instability. Uh, you have pockets of ISIS, as I said, between Diyala, Hawija, Kirkuk, uh, villages like Adhem, Ham, uh, Hamrin, Bukhriz, Ntebija, Zaytun, pretty remote areas, uh, the road from Diyala to, to Kirkuk. Um, observers, Iraqi observers, uh, often blame uh, Barzani, the, uh, the, the KDP, and they call these guys jokingly the Daesh Merga, so combining Peshmerga with Daesh. Um, rightly or wrongly, that they say that these this phenomenon is a result of KDP neglect or KDP provocations. I have no evidence for that. At the moment, my view is that the PMF could finish these guys uh, in an instant if they wanted to, but they kind of want a reminder of why they exist. It, it benefits certain political actors in Iraq to have a residual ISIS there to kind of scare people, remind people of who saved them from ISIS. Uh, 
in their view, the, the PMF factors, and also make a body look weak in terms of the elections. But anyway, this, this ISIS is, uh, presence is not very threatening to the general order. Um, we won't see a return of the insurgency in Anbar. There's a, some desert area between Fallujah and Mosul that's still a bit insecure, but uh, it could be highway robbery. We have 3,000 Sunni candidates participating in the elections. They'll get between 85 to 100 seats, perhaps. As I said, even former hardliners who supported the insurgency and are tied to the rise of ISIS in 2013 and welcomed ISIS initially are now participating in the elections and the political process. Um, I am a bit concerned about Saudi intervention and, and meddling, but at least the Saudis have accepted uh, the new Iraq. And that's one of the, the things I'm most pleased to see. The entire region has finally accepted Iraq from Turkey to Saudi Arabia. Um, they're cooperating uh, with the new government. I am concerned there's this paranoia in Washington. If Abadi doesn't, isn't, doesn't become the next prime minister, oh my God, Iran won. Iran, uh, we lost Iraq to Iran. The, there's a, a focus on Abadi as the only option, and therefore, if it's some other candidate, you may see the Iran, the anti-Iran hawks in Washington overreacting. Um, the role of Iran will be reduced as states stabilize. I mean, Iran intervened to support central states in Iraq and Syria to help them restore sovereignty over their territory. Um, so we, we, moving on to Syria, while in Iraq we, the international community, assist the return of the state, in Syria we oppose the return of the state. Um, so the return of the state in Iraq means more international support, uh, more stability, um, and the more you have the state returning, the less you have ISIS. Also, the more you have the state returning in Iraq and Syria, the less you have Russia and Iran, of course. Um, while ISIS 2.0 is unlikely to, to occur in Iraq and Syria, Obviously, in Iraq, with the return of the state plus the international assistance, um, the necessary steps are, uh, steps are being taken. But in Syria, that's not being taken, but we don't see a political vacuum because we see non-state governance emerging in certain areas with international support and with a strong capacity to control the population. So the Syrian government is directly or indirectly taking control over much of the country, either through military victories or through so-called reconciliations. It'll retake the remaining pockets in northern Homs in the, in the south. But we also see these emerging Turkish and American zones where you have this non-state kind of governance. Now, the U.S. could have declared victory in Syria when it, defeated, when it helped defeat ISIS, and it could have left. Instead, the Trump administration made itself into a spoiler and decided we're not going to leave. We're going to stay and act like a small country, not like a great power, because we don't want Iran and Russia to win, which means it's kind of an indefinite presence and it prevents the normalization of life in Syria. Um, now, the, we don't know what American policy is. The U.S. may or may not stay in its basis uh, throughout the Northeast. If it does stay, then the Syrian PKK, known as the PYD, is going to grow more dependent on the U.S. and less integrated into the region, which places the Kurds of Syria in a very long-term danger, because at some point the U.S. is going to leave, and the Turks or other actors just can't wait to get their hands on them. What the U.S. could be doing is encouraging the integration of the Kurds into the rest of Syria, which would reassure Turkey um, and, and prevent the eventual attack on the Kurds, which will otherwise take place. Uh, in the Northwest, we have an emerging stability with this long-term Turkish occupation of northern Syria and the implication that the Turks are going to be responsible for taking care of Nusra, now known as, as HTS, and taking care of the foreign jihadis that are now in this the Turkish colony that's being created. The Russians aren't going to do anything about this Turkish colony because they prioritize their relationship with Turkey. They know that they can't lose Syria um, no matter what. So neither, as we saw with Afrin, the Russians are placing a high emphasis on maintaining the relationship with, with Turkey. Iran, Hezbollah don't mind this either because at least somebody is in charge of this sort of Al-Qaeda zone um, in, in northern uh, Syria. So it appears like the Turks may end up occupying this area in the long term, much like Israel has this long term occupation over the Golan Heights. Um, so we'll see emerging from this area, the occasional Al-Qaeda attack on checkpoints, that kind of thing, but it appears to be quite stable. It's actually a free trade zone between Turkey and Syria. So everybody has an economic interest in maintaining this zone stable, uh, including HTS or Nusra, because economically they all need this uh, to succeed. So Syria is going to be divided into three, unless the Americans, unless Trump is sincere about his urge to, uh, to leave. Nobody really knows. Um, and we'll see a direct role for foreign forces in the midterm, U.S. and Turkey, and they're embedded into the military structures in these two zones, preventing the government of Syria or the Russians from, from taking them. Um, okay, I'll, I'll stop you there. Sorry. <laughs> um, Ambassador, uh, your response, I guess, to the, 
quasi-competing visions of, of Dave and Nir. How do you see the emerging order um, of Iraq and its neighbors? I mean, how, given, given what we've heard from Dave and Nir, do you agree with their assessments? Where would you find, pick differences? Would I dare agree with, to disagree with such experts? <laughs> well, they disagree with each other, so yeah, you can. Um, <laughs> well, well, look, I mean, uh, from, from an Iraqi perspective, uh, our, our policy is to pursue what I'd call um, uh, proactive neutrality. Um, and the reason for that is if you look at the composition of the Iraqi population, uh, we are um, a mixture. We have extensions into our neighboring countries. So we can't be part of any access against any, uh, from, with anybody against anybody. And we'd like to have as less, uh, the least amount of tension possible. With regard to Syria, uh, well, our, our position is, is quite clear. We support Geneva, and uh, we would like the Syrians to be masters in their home. Uh, what, the, what the final uh, outlook for Syria is should be the decision of the Syrian population. I, you know, the, the main concern that the Iraqi government has is twofold. First of all, we would like to protect ourselves from the remnants of ISIS that are still in Syria. We're still getting insurgents crossing the border and doing uh, damage to, to Iraqis and to Iraq. But we'd, we'd also like to see, and that's a, that's a really uh, you know, bothersome thing, the, the, the death toll in Syria dwarfs what has happened in Iraq. And that's not saying nothing. I mean, uh, there's a wonderful group of people in, uh, out in London uh, called Iraq Body Count. And they've tabulated the number of civilian casualties in Iraq since 2003. They're around 200,000, that would take a few tens. Uh, in Syria, in less than half the time, we've had more than twice the number of victims. So something should be done to reduce the, uh, the death toll. And what, whatever, from our perspective, whatever means is chosen to achieve that goal is the one we should choose. I want to pick up on the, you know, ISIS 2.0 or not. It's very difficult to pick up a, a magazine in town here without seeing something about ISIS 2.0. It's become kind of the next cottage industry. Dave, you seem to think that's a thing with the International and the affiliates. Um, of course, if we follow your analogy, the International didn't do so well after the main territorial base in the Soviet Union collapsed. Um, why do you disagree with Nir? Why will there be this 2.0? <clears throat> so I'm interested in his, his uh, detailed view, but I'm not 100% sure we really disagree, right? Because the point that I made was that it, whether you think it's post-ISIS or not depends on what you mean by ISIS. And I think if we're talking about the territorial caliphate that controlled cities and drove around in T-55s and all that in Iraq and Syria, that's not coming back. You know, I, I don't think we're going to see the re-emergence of that. Um, but... Um, you know, in Somalia, in Libya, in Cameroon, in uh, Nigeria, in Turkey, in Europe, uh, we have uh, the, if you like, the ideas and the innovations and the ideology and the structure that was pioneered by that territorial state is now um, sort of free-floating. Um, we haven't really talked about Afghanistan, but that was covered in a previous panel, but the emergence of ISIS or ISPK uh, in Afghanistan is, is another example where you know, it sort of lives on after the, the death of the caliphate. Um, I also really like Nir's um, ecological analogy. Um, two people that you should read if you haven't, uh, Rafe Sagarin, who's unfortunately dead now, and Dominic Johnson from uh, the UK, who've both written about the mathematical application of Darwinian evolutionary theory to insurgent groups. And um, there's actually fairly good evidence to suggest that natural selection processes work uh, on a population of insurgents much like they do on any other population. And in this case, there's also artificial selection because we're picking people and, and whacking them and that's having an improving effect on uh, the population that we're dealing with. The stupid and the unlucky uh, don't make it and the guys that survive to the next round are the better guys. And um, it, what we've done here, and in particular if we pull out of, uh, of Syria too early, uh, will be like taking antibiotics and then stopping the course before you finish and you end up with a drug resistant strain that comes back stronger than ever. Um, so will they run around with tanks and control cities? I, I don't think so. Um, but I don't think they're gone. Uh, so, it, and I wouldn't say it's ISIS 2.0, it's about ISIS yeah. 5 or 6 now at this point. Yeah, um, yeah. So we don't disagree 
it won't be ISIS, because ISIS is the Islamic State in Iraq and Sham. That's dead. However, certainly the Islamic State in Cameroon, Mali, Algeria, Afghanistan, um, it may not seize vast amount of territory, but we're likely to see violence inspired by that for a long time. But the reason why there won't be an ISIS 2.0 in Syria and Iraq it requires understanding what led to the rise of ISIS in the first place. It wasn't just Maliki is a bad guy, he's oppressing Sunnis, Sunnis get angry, they join ISIS. This is a, a caricature that is very commonly uh, seen here in DC. Um, first of all, in the Maliki days, there was, it was quite mixed. In Anbar, you didn't see um, Shia forces, you saw um, the economy was doing great in 2012. Uh, you saw six ministers, I think, from Anbar in Maliki's government. Uh, they didn't have any legitimate grievances against the government that any other Iraqi wouldn't have. In Mosul, the relationship with the Iraqi army was very tense and it was quite different. Um, but there was something happening in the region in 2012 and 13 which led to the rise of ISIS. It was a perfect storm um, in that you had this phenomenon wrongly called the Arab Spring, but these Arab uprisings taking on a Sunni sectarian um, element in certain countries and it gave the defeated insurgency in Iraq the hope that Dixie will rise again, so to speak. Um, and much for the same reason that many Trump voters uh, were unhappy with having a black president in, in the US. Um, and that was one of their main motivations, perhaps. You saw a similar phenomenon in, uh, in, in Iraq. Some people just refused to accept that there could be a Shia leader in Iraq. And, and I think in Anbar, that may have been the case. And there was a move, Syria is gonna fall to a Sunni insurgency and we can perhaps undo this historical injustice of having a Shia leadership uh, government um, imposed on us in, in Iraq. Um, and you had support coming in from the Gulf, from Saudi Arabia and Qatar, to various actors um, in, in, Syri in Iraq. But most importantly was the porous Turkish-Syrian border. There wouldn't have been an ISIS uh, 1.0 were it not for the, the Turkish-Syrian border, where you had thousands of foreign fighters coming in, seizing control of, of this area, which the US is very much implicated in creating, a failed state zone. Um, you're receiving support from uh, jihadists around the world and basically invading Iraq and, and seizing control of much of Iraq through this failed state that had been created in Syria. So now you have the region is entirely against these days this kind of phenomenon. Um, Saudi Arabia and Qatar are competing to see who is more anti-terrorist these days. There's nobody supporting internally or externally this kind of Sunni extremist language. Um, the move is towards restoring state sovereignty the experience of ISIS was so brutal for most of the people living under its uh, control that we now see them wanting revenge, whether in uh, the Kurdish held areas of, of northeastern Syria or in Anbar or Nineveh, people want revenge against families of ISIS guys even. There's been a real backlash against it. So this is again part of that so-called blessings of ISIS that I referred to. Great. Um, I think with that we'll go to the audience. We're almost out of time, so. If I may just say one. Sure, I'm, just, I'm sorry, go ahead. Um, Following up on your, one thing that is always underestimated is the role of states in terrorism. I really believe that terrorism is a state industry. It's very expensive to get all these weapons and all this training. Why don't we search for the states behind the terrorists? I mean, Jabhat al-Nusra had multiple plastic surgeries so that it can fit within the, you know, Saudi coalition supported it. I mean, without states, unless we face these states, that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Candace. Hi, thanks for the great panel. Um, so much expertise uh, on, on the floor today. Um, all of you are, are wonderful to hear from. Um, I, I really had a sort of puzzle over the Turkey, um, Russia, uh, Iran axis um, concept. It's really quite something to really think about um, because historically speaking, we know these types of axes. Uh, what they usually lead up to is a much more embroiled state for the entire world. Um, so I want to ask the question, actually, you provoked this thought in me, Dave. Uh, you know, is it, is it an access in which uh, it could be operable if it's Erdogan's Turkey, or is it anybody's Turkey uh, that that access needs to sort of be, to have it sort of be in play? Do you know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. essentially, um, the one difference between, you know, Russia and Iran, those are fairly sta stable authoritarian states. Um, Erdogan may or may not stay forever, um, and certainly there's a little bit more flexibility in the system there, so I wonder whether or not that access power would hold uh, long term. I, I think that's a great question. I don't know if I know the answer to it. I mean, I, I think um, 
obviously Turkey now is a very different country in some ways than it was before the coup attempt. But in other ways, it's still very similar and it still has the same geopolitical interests in the region that it had in 2015 when it was trying to achieve a rather similar territorial buffer uh, to what we're seeing now. Um, so my current impression is that this axis that we're seeing emerge is really around the Astana process. That's why I call it the Astana axis. It's about coming to a political resolution of the conflict in Syria and maybe depending on what we think is going to happen with that, um, it will either hold together or break apart uh, once that reaches some kind of um, resolution. Um, so I think I, I'm sort of taking a watching brief at the moment on, on, on where that's going. I think it has really significant geopolitical implications for the region, as I said. It also has some pretty major military implications for NATO uh, and others. Um, but uh, I'm not sure it's necessarily a threatening development in itself. It's just that it, it's like the rise of Kurdistan. It changes a lot of things that we sort of took for granted and causes things to realign. Um, yeah, so short answer is I don't know. <laughs> Maybe just a brief comment on that. From a regional point of view, this, uh, not from an American point of view perhaps, this is a positive development. These are countries of the region cooperating to tackle uh, common threats. Now, Turkey's policy changed, but Turkey was contributing for a long time to instability. Um, for several years at least, uh, 2011 to 2015 maybe. Um, but now we see Turkey, Russia and Iran cooperating in favor of, insta uh, of stability mm -hmm. and in a sense to counter some of the American blunders which have led to greater instability. You could include supporting the PKK in the absence of a larger strategy uh, as part of that, which is obviously very alarming to Turkey, uh, destabilizing the state in Syria, leading to the rise of ISIS and, and, uh, and uh, other actors of great concern to Russia and Iran. Um, so we may not like these actors, but they're acting, these are local actors acting to uh, provide a local stability um, in areas where the US only has a limited and perhaps temporary interest. Great, one more quick question. Yeah, David, right here. Thanks, um, David Sturman with New America. My question is, um, ISIS in the period leading up to its declaration of the caliphate did a masterful job of stitching together a whole, whole bunch of regional grievances into its master narrative. I think we've really, to a large extent, taken that master narrative for granted. Yeah. I'm wondering um, to what extent is the US in a position to once again push down um, these sort of various conflicts in the region you point to back into local complaints? And is the US even capable of resolving 20 odd or keeping on a low burn 20 odd local conflicts? Or is it inevitable that the master narrative will um, reemerge? Thanks. Nadi? Uh, you know, in my security studies uh, course that I teach at Kansas State University, I teach a brilliant book called Master Narratives of Islamic Extremists. Actually, the authors are from ASU and it's brilliant, I highly recommend it. And David pointed out to something really important and again, it is related to ideas which are always like, mm, too simple, too easy, let's just do it the hard way, the military way. But the master narrative of the caliphate, this idea that if only we have a caliphate, we in the Arab world, in the Muslim world, will have no problems, no unemployment, everything will be great, we'll be a military power so nobody can bully us. And how do we get there? How did we get there the first time? You know, you kill, pillage, maim, and slave your way through it. But it works, it worked before. So let's have a caliphate again. So how do we deconstruct this? If we really wanna, if we're serious about deconstructing this, this has never actually been scrutinized because we do not have the space where ideas can compete and where we can really scrutinize history. It's not so simple. It wasn't the killing and pillaging and conquering that actually created that. It, 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 there's a myriad of reasons and m specific moments that that was possible then and we are, as, as um, previous panelists pointed out, we are at a time where it, it's not okay to conquer other countries, so come up with something uh, different, it's not okay to use violence. And Nair mentioned the Arab Spring. When we talk about the Arab Spring, that is a movement that was very peaceful, that toppled five regimes. And no terrorists have record of toppling five regimes. But the counter-revolution, which is real, which is state 
run just like a lot of terrorism. It's a state industry. The counter-revolution, both by Islamist and states, use the only mechanism, violence or the threat of violence. And unless we remove violence as an option, as a legitimate option, there's no way we're going to solve these problems. I'll let uh, Ambassador Fareed have the last word since we're out of time. Well, ISIS and their ideology are totalitarians, mm -hmm. and totalitarians don't engage in debates. Mm -hmm. And their narratives stumble and fall when they meet the test of reality, Absolutely. when people reject them. Look at Mosul right now. It's alive and doing well. The real issue now is emerging, is preventing people who will follow these ideologies, who are always there. I mean, we still have neo-Nazi groups, even though the Reich was destroyed 70 years ago. You have these ideologies all over the place. What we need to do is to prevent them from getting together, from aggregating, from de developing the tools that allow them to have global propaganda and global recruitment, which is something that Iraq suffered from. Uh, I'm talking about social media networks. Uh, something needs to be done to police them. I I'm using this word advisedly. Uh, thank you. All right, thank you. Ambassador Nadia, Dave, Nir, thank you very much. And thank you.